Hello. How's everyone doing? Welcome to the stream. Bueno. Awesome. 
So, I've got a little bit of a spooky theme for October. Don't be scared by the ghosts. Only I can see them. Or I can only I can interact with them. Um, so welcome again, Computer Science 4300. We just got back from our midterm break. I'm sure nobody had any assignments to work on over the break, right? Um, well, at least you didn't have to, to log into Twitch, right? So it's a little bit of a break, at least. Um, so yeah, so assignment two is, uh, is due on Tuesday. That is, uh, five days away, I believe. Tuesdays are still five days away from Thursday. And when that is due on Tuesday, we will be talking about assignment three. Assignment three is going to be super fun. It's one of the cooler assignments. Um, I have also made assignment four really fun as well. I've done a lot of work on that. Um, I've been streaming a little bit at night of my work on assignment four. And so I'll give you a sneak peek of assignment four as well today. Today's lecture uh, won't actually be that long. So I had a bit of a, a, a long lecture earlier today with 3200. But today's lecture for this class won't be that long at all. We're going to talking about... Um, game or uh, the the action system that we're going to be using for our game and talk a little bit of how how that could be used for things like replays or networking and stuff like that so let's get right into some powerpoint slides and then i'm going to do some live coding okay so there's not many slides today though here we go cool so today we're going to be talking about our game actions and a little bit about uh, replay systems. Um, it'll turn out that we're going to make our game actions, um, the system for our game actions is going to be so intuitive and so awesome that I won't even have to tell you how to implement a replay file. You'll just be able to know how to do that. So game actions, what do I mean by a game action? Well, in this context, a game action is going to be an input given by the player of the game to be carried out by the game engine in some way. Um, actions can also be called commands. So a lot of places call this the command structure rather than the action structure. I just like the action, the word action better than command. And so, for example, we may want to give an action input to our game like jump or walk right or shoot or move the menu cursor up or down, or select this text option, right? So all of these are the actions that we want to input. And here, um, the actions are like the intuitive notion of what we want to happen. We're not talking about like, press the left arrow. Those are inputs. But the action is what we want to actually happen. So jump, for example. So game action inputs... So the actual thing you press often come of the form of events such as key presses, mouse movement, controller buttons, etc. So there's lots of different ways that we can put input into our program. But what we want is a way of handling the actions that those inputs represent. So ideally, what we want to do is to be able to decouple the action logic from the inputs that call them. Right? So we don't want to, so for an example in assignment two, which I'll show, we had things like if the W key is pressed, move the player up. Or if the mouse button is pressed, shoot the thing. Right? We don't want to be relying on specific inputs to trigger our actions. So what we can do with this then is we can do things like remap keys. Right? So we would be able to say, okay, we want to do the jump action when this key is pressed, and we'll be able to change that key um, to another key, for example. So how can we accomplish this? So how will we actually implement it? So in assignment two, so far, we've been performing actions directly inside the SFML event loop. And so what we've done is we've said when a specific key is pressed, then some specific logic gets called. And so we've directly tied the logic to the input event, which is really not what we want to have happen. In our current engine so far for assignment two, we wouldn't be able to separate the two, right? Or remap the keys, etc. So let's look at the assignment two uh, architecture again. 
So in the game class, which is really the only class that we have which does all the systems, we have a user input system that handles the user input. And inside that user input system, we have something like the following. So this would be inside of our um, SFML event loop. So we would say while event.poll or while window.poll event. So we'd say, if this is of the type a key press event, then we'll look at the key code and we'll switch based on that key code. And we'll say, okay, if it's escape, then maybe I'll set running to false. If it's W, then the player's input um, component up gets set to true. If it's A, so we've directly tied the user input to the thing that we want to happen, right? So this is the input, the keyboard key, and this is sort of the action that we want to have. It's the effect of the action that we want to have. Similarly down here, um, when the P key is pressed, we set paused, etc. So that's not ideal. But for assignment two, it was fine. We had really simple things happening. Um, and so it was okay for that. We had one simple class. But what we're going to do now is we're going to show how we can get away from this. And um, so in assignment two, all of our input handling and systems logic was done in the game class since we only had one type of scene, right? So we hadn't had scenes yet. We talked about scenes last time. So moving forward, we're going to have a game engine class. We talked about the uh, assignment three architecture updates in a previous lecture. And so in that game engine class, we're going to have many different types of scene objects. So we could have menu scene, we could have an overworld scene, we could have a, a battle scene, etc. So let's just quickly recall what we're going to do with these classes. So the game engine class, here's the, the game engine. We're going to store the top level game data in the game engine. So for example, the things like the assets, the window, and the scenes. It's going to um, perform the top level functionality. So the game engine class going forward now is going to be handling the input from the player. It's going to run the main loop and then um, the game engine pointer will be passed to different scenes so that we can access that. So for example here now in the game engine class we have this user input system. Okay, So we'll see how, how that's going to work in a bit. In the scene base class, remember how we have a scene base class and then we have derived scene classes? This is going to store common scene data, such as entities, frame count, and actions. So we didn't really know what this meant last time, but now what we have is we have this action map. And I'm going to talk about what that is in a bit. So scene-specific functionality is carried out in the derived classes, but the base class stores the things that all scenes will have. And again, this is an abstract function. It cannot be instantiated. And over here, um, these abstract functions, which are in C++, they're declared with equals zero. These need to be defined in the derived class. And so now each of our derived classes is going to have a do action function, which is going to take in an action and then do that action. And we'll see exactly how that's going to be done soon. And then in the derived class, um, it stores spe scene specific data. It stores the scene specific systems. And some scene derived classes may be very different from other scenes. And so remember, we have to have this update function, the render function, and the do action function have to be implemented for each of the different scene derived classes. And we can see down here that what we're interested in today is this do action function. And you can see that there's no user input function on the scene derived class. Okay, so we the scenes are not going to care about user input. They're just going to care about doing actions. So let's try and implement a system now where the scene only knows the type of action that the player wants to perform. And it doesn't care about the input method whatsoever. And so what this is going to accomplish is that the actions could come from anywhere. They could come from the keyboard, they could come from the mouse, they could come from a file, they could come from a network stream, from a VR controller, from anything. The scene just knows, oh, I want to do this type of action. I don't care where the input um, from the user actually came from. 
So the action class that we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to construct an action class which will store the type of action that the player wants the scene to perform. Okay, so of course we're using nice object-oriented programming. We're going to have this action class and what we actually want the, the, the scene to do, we store inside this action class. All user input is going to be handled within the game engine class. And when it reads the user input, the actions are going to be created and then sent to the scenes to have their logic carried out. And the scenes will have a do action function that performs the logic based on some input action object. Okay, so the action class, what is it going to look like? So actions are be go going to be given um, a name. So for example, we could have an action called jump or an action called move left or an action called shoot. And action, if we think about this now, actions need one other variable because when we input, when we have user input from the keyboard or from a controller, actions actually have two phases, okay? There's the press phase and the release phase. And that typically denotes the start and the end of an action. And so, um, actions will then have two main variables. So they'll have the name. So this is the name of the action. So jump or shoot, etc. And then the type of action. So maybe I should change that to phase, but for now it's type. And so this is start or end. So for example, if you think about playing a video game with a controller, right? You could think about pressing the up key and your character will start to move up. And then you release the up key and your character will stop moving up, right? So, whereas before it, it kind of felt like one action, right? The pressing of the key and the releasing of the key, that is actually two separate inputs that you're sending to your system. So, our actions are going to be, if you wanted to move up and then stop moving up, you would have up, start, and then at some point later, um, you would have up, end. Okay. So this is our action class that we're going to use. An action is going to have a name and it's going to have a type, right? So the name would be like jump and the type would be start or end. We're going to have a constructor for these and we're going to have some functions that are little helper functions like being able to get the name, being able to get the type. So very, very simple action class. Now, these are strings here. As I said at the beginning of the course, this course is a balance between functionality, usability and optimization. If you were to write your own game and you wanted it to be as performant as possible, instead of using strings here, you might have action types. Like, we want to be able to create any type of game with this engine that we're writing. And so as a string, we can give this any value that we want. But if we were a game designer and we knew beforehand exactly what type of actions would be in our game, we could replace these strings with integers and make them just a little bit faster, right? Because what we're going to be doing is a string comparison, which is a little bit slow, but the number of actions that we're parsing is not the bottleneck of the program. So even though we are using strings and comparing them and using them is a little bit slower than integers, that's really not where the bottleneck is in our program. Excuse me. So how then would we map keys to actions? So someone in the chat said like enumeration, yes, you could have an enum and what an enum does is it just sets up the integers for you. So when I say it's an integer, it could be an enum or it could be a manually inputted integer. So we want to be able to specify which user input. So if it's a button, a keyboard key, a mouse click, whatever maps to a specific action object. In SFML, all keyboard keys have corresponding integer values. So what we're going to do, because assignment three and assignment four, excuse me, um, we're only going to be using keyboard input. We're just going to, to, to realize, okay, keyboard keys have corresponding integer values. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a map from integers to strings. And the integer is going to be the SFML keybo, key, blah key code for the keyboard key and the string is going to just be the name of the action to be performed. So for example, if we wanted the spacebar to jump, then the integer would be whatever key um, SFML uses for space 
and then the string would be jump. So we're going to create a, a map from Insta actions. Sorry, from Insta strings. So in the scene base class, we're going to store that map. So in the scene base class, we have something called the action map, and that maps these key codes into strings, which are the names of actions. So in order to register a key to an action, we're going to create a function called register action. And so that takes in an int and a string, which will insert the action name into the map at the given key code. And this is really easy. So all we have to do is say m action map input key equals action name. So for example, again, m action map spacebar integer equals jump in quotation marks. Now each scene is going to have its own map. And so we can have different actions available in each scene. So for example, if we're talking about our menu, right, our game menu, we might want W to go up in the menu, S to go down in the menu. But in the playing of the game, we want W to maybe walk us up and uh, S to walk us down. And so it's really easy that what we can do now is just have one map per scene where we can map those different actions. But how are we actually going to create the action objects? Okay. So the creating the action objects. The game engine class is going to handle the actual user input key presses and construct the action to send to the current scene. When a key is pressed in the game engine's user input function, the game engine is going to ask the current scene if it has an action associated with the key's integer value. If the scene has the action name, we can create an action object with the corresponding type. So what we can do is we can say, if it was a key press, we start this type of action. And if it was a key release, we end this type of action. So what does this code actually look like? And I'm going to be giving you this code with the assignment. And then later on in the project, you're going to be modifying this. So let's just look at this code. So inside the game engine, the game engine has a user input function. And this is inside the SFML event loop, right? And we're going to say if the type of event was a key press or it was a key release, that's what we're going to do here. What we can do first is we're going to check if the scene has an action that's corresponding to this key press. So for example, if I have my actions in the scene as W, A, S, and D for moving around and the space bar is jumping and the player presses like the H key or the J key or something like that, we don't want, there's no action associated with that. So we don't want to do anything. So that's what this first line here does. So the game engine is going to get the current scene and it's going to get its action map and it's going to try and find the key code that we just pressed. And if we can't find anything, so this, this syntax here is how you look up if something exists within a map. You say if the map.find is equal to the map.end. So what this does is it says if we can't find this key code that has been mapped in the scene, then we just continue. Okay, so we skip this function or we skip the processing of this key code because the scene doesn't have an action associated with it. Therefore, we don't need to worry about it. Okay. Next, we're going to construct the action type and this is either starting or ending. So we determine the start or end by whether it was a key press or a key release. So we're going to set up the variable and then we're going to ask, was the event type a key press? If yes, then it's a start action. If no, then it's an end action, right? So if we're pressing the key, then we want to start this type of action. And if we're releasing the key, then we want to end this type of action. So now all that's left is to get the name. And we know that the scene has a name stored because up here we check to make sure. So we're going to look up that action and create it in the scene. So I'm going to, or, or send the action to the scene. So here I'm going to create the action variable, right? So I'm going to create it. The very first argument, so here, this is where we're creating the action. The first argument to the action constructor 
is going to be the name of the action. And the second is going to be the type of action that we just figured out. So we, we call the current scene, we say get the action map, and then we say what is the value at event.key.code. And that's the name. So if that was jump, then here we're going to have jump. If it was left, we're going to have left. If it was right, we're going to have right. And then the, the type that we just figured out by whether or not it was a key press or a key release, this forms the action. So this whole action, this is the action. And then we call the current scenes do action function with that action as the parameter. So that's how this is going to work. And this handles all of our cases of keyboard events. So that's really cool. Like these three lines of code are going to wrap all of our keyboard events. They're going to create an action and they're going to send that action off to the scene to do the particular thing. Okay. So now that we have constructed the action object in the game engine, we send it to the scene to have its logic performed. This is done by the derived scene classes s do action. So it's the do action system. Okay, that's what the s is. Um, and we take in a const reference to an action. We're going to read the name and the type of the action and perform its logic without knowing what user input created it. Okay, so what about replays? So some games, or a lot of games actually, they have functionality to be able to record gameplay in the form of replays. So replays are different from videos. If you wanted to, to watch back something, nowadays video recording is so popular. Um, let's go back to like Doom, okay, in the, in the 1990s. If I wanted to show you my video of me playing like a level in Doom, then I couldn't just record a video and send it to you over the internet because that would be like hundreds of megabytes and internet back then was really, really slow. And so what the game did is it actually recorded your inputs and stored them in a replay file. And then when you go to, um, if you want to watch it back, I can just send you this replay file, which might be just a, a few kilobytes. And you can say, hey, Mr. Game Engine, please replay this, this sequence of actions. And so now that our scenes don't care about where an action came from, we can see how easy it is to, to implement replay files. So for example, in the game engine, we could just record our action strings in a file and print them like one per line um, with, the specific, with the specific frame that they were performed on. And then if we want to play it back later, we could load the file and the game engine class could feed the actions to the scene, right? So rather than using the user input, we could, we could have a replay function which loads a file and then plays them. So let's have a look at a real world example of this from assignment four. Um, and also here, for example, is, a, is an example replay file that we could have. So let's say we wanted on like frame uh, 60. Oh, Windows was telling me that I that didn't find any viruses. Thank you for that update, Windows. So let's say one second into the game, we want to start running right. And then one second later, at frame 100, so 60 frames a second. So one second into the game, we say right start. Then we want to run, let's say we want to run right for two seconds. So two seconds later, we could have right end. And then maybe we want to, one second later, um, we can jump, start. And let's say like uh, 10 frames later, we want to jump, end. And so we can very easily record this as a replay and then later on um, play it back. So your projects in the course, all of your projects are going to require you to implement replays for your games. Um, so I'm going to give you the code that does the action side of things, all the action map, all that kind of stuff is going to be done for you. Okay. So for the assignments, you can focus on the gameplay mechanics, but inside your project, one of the people on the team is going to have to implement replays because I want you to be able to send me a replay of cool stuff, ha cool stuff happening in your game engine. 
But now you can see like how easy that is given the system that we have. So let's have a quick look at what I'm talking about. So here is a sneak peek at assignment four. All right, so I've got music in it now. This is assignment four. This is the menu for definitely not Zelda. And I, I wanted to show assignment four because I'm gonna be showing assignment three next class. So if we play the game, we start, the music plays. Can you hear the music? Okay. So this is the game engine that we're making for assignment four. And when I'm sending key inputs, okay, I am not... The, the scene class, the scene for actually playing this is... It doesn't know where the keys are coming from. This could be coming from a replay, it could be coming from a network, it could be coming from my keys, it doesn't know that, right? So I can come down here, I can start attacking um, this knight, for example, right? And it doesn't know where these actions are coming from. This could all be happening in a replay. So this is just a, a sneak peek at assignment four. But what I did was... I'm going to show you how we transition from the old style of user input to the new style of user input. So here is actually my solution code for assignment four, but it's the really easy part. It's just the input, right? So here we have our uh, a user input system, and this is on the, um, the scene Zelda class. So this is what we're not going to be doing in this course, but it it's, I, I implemented it this way just to show you how we would go from this to the new system. So if we look over here, we have our action class, right? So our action class is just as we showed it in the slides. We have a name and we have a type. If we go over to the scene base class, the scene base class has this action map, right? And so that action map is a map from ints to strings where we are going to store... Um, the actual mapping from keys to actions. Also, um, inside the action map, inside the scene class, we're going to have this register action function. And the register action function is going to take an input key, and it's going to take an action name, and it's just going to store that there inside, um, inside the map. Then the scene is going to have a, a do action function. Uh, I may change this a little bit, but this is going to call the the do action system of the um, of the derived class. All right, so now we go over to the Zelda scene, and what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to convert it into the new system. So what do we have to do here? Um, so we're going to get rid of this user input system because the game engine. If we go back to the game engine code. The game engine code is, oh, I'm, I'm given some assignment solution here. I don't want to do that. Um, oh, this is, this is uh, also stuff from the wheel. There we go. We'll delete that for now. So this is the code that I showed in the assignment, right? So it's going to read all the user input, and it's saying if it's key pressed or key released, do all the things that I just said. Okay. So over in the Zelda scene, now what we have to do is we have to do two things. We have to create our do action function, and we have to also register our actions. Alrighty. So in order to create this do action function, I've already got it done down here, right? So this is the do action function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to take this and copy it and paste it down here. Now, what's going to actually happen is where this used to be key pressed or key released, what I'm going to have now is instead of like worrying about the state of keys, I'm worrying about the type of actions. So I'm going to say if action.type equals start or else if action.type equals end right because now we're not we're not worried about keys anymore we're worried about the action type string 
And now let's go into all of this stuff and we can see kind of it's it's really easy to translate this over. Um, so we can we're no longer worrying about individual key codes, but we can say if action.name equals um, let's say we have up. Then what we want to do is we want to say, well, what we were doing before. We'll set the up component of the player input equal to true. Um, one other thing, I have to get this reference here. Okay. And similarly, we're going to do some else ifs. Give me a second here. So you can see what I'm doing here, really easy. Right, left, down. So this will be right, left, down, okay? Let's format this a bit. We also have um, shoot, which is space, or let's say that's um, attack, attack, right? What do we do on attack? Well, we're going to spawn a sword. See how this works? So our actions now are going to be these strings. And the action class is going to do things based on these input actions. But it has no idea where the actions are actually coming from. They're just going to happen on a specific frame. Um, we also have these things which are like... Um, drawing collisions and tiles and stuff like that, but we're not going to worry, we're not going to do all of that stuff right now. So, uh, someone in the chat said it's kind of like message passing, exactly, so our actions are just serializable messages. So again, we could have this do action, this could be, a, this could be, could be a multiplayer game now over a network, and we're just reading in these inputs. So we have to do the same thing down here, um, but we have to do it for the end of actions as well. So down here, if the action is ending, then we're going to set these to false. So this is going to be false. Okay, and there's no end of attack action. Um, there could be, but there's just it doesn't have any meaning in our game. Oh yes, we do actually. So down here, I'm going to call these things. Okay. Now, we can get rid of all this stuff. And, we can get rid of this huge user input system. Let me just uh, comment that out for now, because I need to do stuff with that later in order to make your actual assignment. So now we have this do, do action system, right? So the last thing that we need to do is we need to associate some keys with these actions. So down in my init function, because if I run this now, um, let me go back over to the game engine for a second. Um, I need to remove this because I was calling, yeah, okay. So now if I run this, hopefully this compiles. This calls the user input system. Oh, what's wrong? I see. So the function, I didn't want to comment out the whole thing. I just wanted to comment out the internals of it real quick. So it doesn't actually do anything. All right. So now if I compile it, it should work. Yes. So if I, if I run the game, um, now my keys aren't doing anything. Nothing, nothing I'm doing is actually having any effect. And that's because I haven't registered those actions yet. So here in my init, the scene's base class has this register action function where I can map a key to an action name. So now all I have to do is I can say register action and SF keyboard. Oh look, it has all the keys in here for us. So I can register the W key to be up and then I'm just going to register all my actions like this. So A is going to be left. D is going to be right. 
S is going to be down. And space is going to be attack. And whatever I call these actions here, it doesn't matter as long as I have the corresponding actions up here. So now if I run the game, after I've registered those actions, and I hit the buttons, now I'm moving up, down, left, and right. Cool. Alright, so... It's really efficient, it, it really works. Someone in the chat said it's beautiful. Um, so someone asked, would every entity have actions, like enemies or allied AI? That's completely up to you, right? So here, for example, actions in our, in our case are actions that the player is sending to the game. And so from this point of view, it, it's like we are controlling our character. In this course, we wouldn't be controlling the enemies unless we had some method for switching to those enemies. So these actions um, are whatever you want them to be. If you want to have an action that immediately kills all enemies or moves all enemies up, down, whatever, these actions are exactly what you make them, right? All we've done is we've abstracted the concept of user wanting an action to happen from user input. Now, one X, so for assignment three, you're going to have this in place for you. And assignment four, you're going to have this in place for you as well. One thing that you're going to have to do on the project is that the project game that you make is going to also have to include mouse input. And so something you're going to have to do on your own for the project is figure out how you'll modify the action class to do things like move the mouse. Okay, and that's going to be really interesting. So the actions again, for in the game engine, you're going to detect a mouse movement or a mouse press, and you're going to send in actions there as well, okay? So you'll be able to have mouse movements inside your replays, and, and you'll be really, really, um, you'll be able to do all sorts of cool stuff. All right, so that's how we do that. Now I wanted to show you of an example of this taken to the power of like a million. So. Here is something that we will be not we will not be doing in assignment three, but this is actually something that I do for my research. So this is my actual research that I'm conducting right now into artificial intelligence. So this is very much like assignment three, but I've taken this assignment and bumped it up a couple of notches. So what I've done is I've taken this action system and I've used it to create replays. And not only that, but you can play back replays as ghosts, okay? And this is also something that I want you to do in the project. So I've combined this as well with some artificial intelligence. So in my research, this is what I'm doing. So here is the level. If I want the AI to figure out what is the sequence of actions that I take to get to a place most efficiently, I can do that by right-clicking. So if I right-click anywhere in the level, my AI system will run, it will figure out the sequence of actions to get to that place, it will record those actions in a replay data structure, it will spawn a ghost replay and play it back. So if I right-click right here, that's what happens. The AI figures out a sequence of actions to get to there, creates a replay from that, and then plays back a ghost replay inside the game engine. So here, let me do that a few times. And, like, it's awesome. If, also, let me restart it so there's not a bunch of replays around. If I middle mouse click, it will actually take over the player. So instead of actually spawning a replay, it will take over the player. And all this is done using actions. Okay? Now watch this. This particular search is actually done at the action level. So if I tell it I want to go to the right side of the screen, it will actually do all those actions. So the AI in this is, is pretty smart, right? It's actually really good. Um, if I want to jump back over here, 
it'll like shoot the piranha plant and go back over. So one of the parts of my research that that I want to do is use this system for game testing. And let's say that I want to spawn a bunch of random AIs and those random AIs are going to like try and find bugs in the game. Well, what I can do is I can hit this button. Let's say we want to spawn 300 random AIs and have them spawn ghost replays and have that playing back so we can see what those AIs are doing. So that's pretty cool. We can also see if I rerun it and I spawn them all from here, we can see where these ghost replays are actually dying. And so we can see sort of the hot spots of the map where where these sorts of actions happen. Actually, this is this is really interesting. So let me run this back. And I'll spawn I'll spawn some things up here. And what you should see is that you're going to get a bunch of um, stuff around the piranha plant here. So you know then if you were going to test the game, um, that 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 area where all these Mega Men are stuck, that's probably an area of interest or an enemy that those random AIs couldn't couldn't actually get by. So this is like assignment three taken to the next level. Oh, and another thing that you're going to have to do on your project, and we'll have a, 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 a class on this later, and it also shows off the power of this AI system, is that you can actually live edit the level. So I can take blocks on the level and like live edit while I'm playing the level. And, and this is actually, with the ECS system, eventually what we're going to see is that all you have to do in order to do something like this is create a draggable system and attach a draggable component to anything in the game. So what you can actually have for your final game project, if you want, let's say you actually have a game like this, where it's like, oh, I can't reach this place over here but you have certain types of bricks that are actually draggable, right? So what I could do is drag a brick over here and jump and then drag another brick and jump and then jump over here. So you can see like all the cool sorts of game mechanics that this would actually introduce just by having you be able to drag things around. And we're also going to be doing a level editor and this draggable technology is going to be in our level editor. So for your projects, you're also going to have a level editor for your game, so you don't have to... We will also have level editing for Assignment 3, but Assignment 3, you're actually going to be, like, manually in a text file um, saying where you want certain things to appear. And I don't have time to go over all that right now, but, yeah, so this is like, if people have taken Computer Science 4770, kind of flashbacks of that, but we're doing it in C++ now, so it's, it's better, right? And that was actually, so I'm making up for my super long 3200 lecture this morning. That is basically all that I have for, for this lecture. It's just the action system. And what we're going to do if we go back to here is we can see that uh, on Tuesday's class, I'm going to spend the whole class going over assignment three. And assignment three has a lot of stuff in it. Assignment 3 has a lot of stuff. Assignment 4 has a lot of stuff. But this lecture is sort of a, a little break, right? So you can get your, your, mid, your midterm break. The hot reloading. Um, someone just asked about reloading. Well, all I really have to do to reload stuff is just press one button because I'm in control of the game engine, okay? Uh, someone asked, when is the Dropbox open for Assignment 2? I apologize. I thought it was. So right after class, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open that um, Dropbox. Do you duplicate the world for each AI? I do, actually. So when you see this, if there's 300 of these AIs running around, I actually am running 300 copies of the scene. And so the game engine is, is doing the physics 300 times, and it's still 60 frames a second. And so you can tell now that this is going to be a really, um, a really nice system that we're using. 
Uh, actually, I could probably show one other thing as well. Let me show one other thing while we're in this lecture, but I'm going to have to do this live. I'm going to have to do this live. Okay, so let's, let's do it live. I'm going to talk about entity, entity class, how they store components, because I, I do have lots of time. So I got to know some more questions. How is the AI finds the piranha plant? It doesn't know anything about a piranha plant. All it does is it knows that this sequence of actions leads me to the goal. Out of curiosity, could that ghost AI system be used as a game mechanic? Sure, of course it could. Um, you could use it to race against, etc. So let's actually do some live coding here. All right, so I'm going to go to my terminal programming. And what I'm going to do now is show you in assignment three All right, so vim entity.cpp. Okay. So we've got include IO stream. We've got um, int main int arg c char star arg v. And return zero. All right. So for assignment two, what I want to talk about now is um, A3 upgraded component storage in entities. And I actually meant to have slides for this, but I think that it's also fun to, to live code this, right? And I'll put, some, I'll put some text in the slides for this. So what do I mean by component storage in entities? Well, what we saw before is that we had an entity class and let's just say I have a class component or a struct, struct component one. And this is going to have just a, like an int in it. And then we're going to have, so we're going to have different types of components, two, three, and maybe this is x1, x2, x3. And then the entity, if I include memory, what we did before was we had public inside entity, we had a standard shared pointer to component one, and this was like mc1, we had a standard shared pointer component two, mc2, and we had a standard shared pointer component three, MC3. Or I guess we didn't have, let's just call these um, C1, C2, and C3. Because we only use the M if it's, um, so for our component, M is a private variable. So our component class, or sorry, our entity class, it was a private constructor, but just for this example, I'm going to make it a public constructor so we can actually make some. Okay. So now what, what we were doing is we were saying something like um, entity E, and then E, if we wanted to access its C1, this is going to equal um, standard or standard make shared C or component one, and then we would pass in its constructor. So that that's how we were accessing things, right? Um, so this is how we would add components to an entity. And then if we wanted to see like, does E have, let me move this down, a component two attached to it, we would say if E.C2 standard C out E entity has a C2 attached. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this because this is basically what we were doing for assignment one. So let me try and run this. 
Okay, missing these. So these uh, structs up here, they actually have to have those. Okay, and the entity class, I always miss the trailing um, semicolons for those. Okay, compiler. This is running on the MUN server, and so sometimes it doesn't like to work properly. So I have just gone offline apparently, but I am still recording locally. So let me try and just fix that while I'm here with you. So this will appear in the YouTube video, which is kind of hilarious. Let me see if I'm still online. I am still online. So if you can hear me, tell me when I go back online. Am I here? Let me check out the Twitch stream. Okay, we're back. Sweet. Yeah, sorry about that. That happened. That's going to happen sometimes. So I need to bring back my programming window because that got disconnected as well. So uh, code 4300. I thought that all that was gone. Vim entity.cpp. Okay, here we go. All right, we're back. Um, so here we'll say else, and I'll trim these recordings together when I put it on YouTube so that we uh, we have a single unified video. So I'm going to have to do some video editing there. Am I, am I still online here? I'm just checking out the stream. Yes, okay, we're still online. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, otherwise we're gonna stay standard C out, no C2 attached. Okay, so we're gonna run this now, hopefully it works, and it says no C2 attached. Okay, so yeah, if Some people may have to refresh the stream. Um, so, here, what I can do is if I add a C2 component, right, then it will say entity has a C2 attached. So this is, this is how we've been doing it up to this point. But this is like working with variable names and these things are public and we... Ideally, what we want to have is private variables that we use a getter and a setter in order to set, all right? So what we want to have, ideally, is a system where we can do something like this. I want to say e uh, add component as a function, or e.get component as a function, or e. Um, has component as a function or e dot remove component as a function. So how am I going to do that? Because the functions are going to take in different types of components as input. So what I have to have like one function for adding a component one and one function for adding a component two and one for adding a f for component three, like that would be a nightmare. We'd be back at the same problem that we have is that we want to get rid of 
of this really clumsy interface. So can anyone out there tell me in C++ how I could make the type of object that I want to pass in here as part of the actual function call? Well, one of, ways, one of the ways to do that is I could use templates. And so here, what I'm going to do is I could say I want to add component and I want that type to be of component one, right? And so what this function would then do, it was it would add a component of type component one to the entity. If I want to get a component, I could then get the component. The check component would look up whether or not um, it actually has this type of component. And so these are the types of functions that we want to have. We don't want to have to be using individual variables. So here, for example, what I would want to be able to do is if uh, component one as a constructor had, um, oh, well, we'll talk about that later. But what I want to do is, is have some sort of way of doing this. And it turns out that there's a really easy way to do this in C++. And that comes through the standard tuple. And I need to Google something real quick. C++ standard tuple. I need to know what to include to use standard tuple. Tuple, okay, that's easy. So a, a tuple or a tuple, some people call it, I'm gonna call it a tuple, tuple. We include that, and then what we can do is we can make a data structure that holds different types of things. So for example, I could make a tuple that goes from int to int and call this t, or I could make a tuple that goes from int to double, okay? And then what I can do is I can say something like t.get int equals four and t.get double equals 3.14. Then down here, if I say standard C out, t.get int, and then a space, and then t.get double. Ideally, what happens now is that it will print out four and 3.14. Oh, Jesus. Oh, sorry. It's not t.get, it's a different syntax. It's standard get int, and we pass in t as the variable. Apologies for that. So standard get double t. And what this does, and now I have to change it down here as well. Standard get double t standard get double t. All right, so now let's see if this works. Oh my Jesus Christ. Argument substitution, I love C++ sometimes. No matching function call for get int, standard tuple, int double. All right, give me a second. I'm gonna look up what I had to do over here, common. That's okay. I'm just curious about why this isn't working now. Uh, let me quit out of here for a second. Vim slash dot bash or Vim RC. Ah, it might be because I wasn't using C plus plus seventeen. So now if I look at this again and I try and call it again. Will this work? Yes. Okay. Thank God. Whew. Crisis averted. Had to use C++ 17. And as someone pointed out in the chat, I was not properly getting the int here. Okay. So this is how I can store a bunch of different things inside a tuple of different class types and then get them out. So can someone tell me what I'm about to do for my entity? And keep in mind, um, also, what I can do is if I want to get the first thing from the tuple, I can get zero, 
You can use these as indices as well. And if I want to get the second thing from the tuple, I can get one. And this, this is the same thing. The get int only works properly if your tuple has exactly one int inside it. If you went from int to int, so if you have like int int double, then standard get int doesn't know which one to get. So if I run this now, it will give me a huge error because there are two ints and I've said get int. So this syntax only works if you have unique types inside the tuple. All right? Okie doke. So what I'm about to do up here is inside the entity, let's privately have a standard tuple. Inside that standard tuple, I'm going to have component one, component two, and component three. And this is going to be my um, M underscore components. There you go. So that's my components. That's how I'm going to store them. And down here, in order to have a function which can get, actually, um, which can get my component, now I can say I'm going to have a function which is going to return a type, right? So it's going to return a reference to a type. I've got to template this. We talked about templates before. So this is a templated function on a, on a type. It's going to return this type. This is going to be get component. Um, and it's going to return standard get t of my m components. See how easy that is? So now when I want to get a component down here, I can just call get component. What I'm going to do uh, as well is called add component. So someone said, wait, no shared pointers anymore. So we will still be using shared pointers to entities, but there will be no shared pointers to components within the entities. So this also, when you use a standard tuple, this means that all the components inside an entity are now contiguous in memory, which means we're going to be getting better cache performance as well, which is really awesome. So this is going to be not only more convenient, but also faster. Now, the, the bad side of this is the following. Because we have like contiguous data structures here in the tuple, it means that we are always going to be allocating the memory for every component type within our entity. So before when we created an entity, we had a bunch of null pointers there, so the memory wasn't created yet. So every entity that we create will by default have an already constructed component of each type. So now you're asking yourself, well, if it already has the component, how do we check whether or not the component is actually attached to the entity? Because if it already exists, we don't have this null pointer check like we did last time. So what we're going to do to solve that problem is we're going to have a class component. And inside the component class, we're going to have a public boolean and this boolean is just going to be public bool has equals false and then each of our components down here oops is going to inherit from component So, each component type is going to inherit from component. The component base class has a boolean which says whether or not this is actually active, right? So maybe we could call this active or something like that, but we'll just leave it as has. So, for example, now, if we want to write a function has component, so we can say template class t, that's going to be the type of component. This function is going to return a bool whether or not this entity has the component. The function name is going to be called has component, right? And the function is going to look like this. 
Well, we're going to want to look up that component and see if the has value is true. If the has value is true, then it has the component. If the has value is false, then it doesn't have the component. And so I could do the standard get stuff, or I could just use the function I already have, which is get component. So I'm going to return get component t dot has. Easy. Because that component has this variable inside it, whether or not it exists, and I can just return that. So now you're saying, well, if it's false in the default constructor, how do you actually set it? Well, we do that in the add component. So let's do the add component. And what this is going to do is, is this going to return anything or is it just going to be void? Yeah, so it's going to be add component. Uh, let's, let's return a reference to the component we're going to take. This is going to be add component. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say that I want to create this component and I want to set it in the place where it lives inside the entity. So the place where it lives is at get component. So I can say get component um, t equals component or equals t. So I'm adding a component. So I'm creating a new component of type t and putting it into the reference where it should live. And then what I also want to do is get component t dot has equals true. So I add the component and then I set the has variable to true after I've added it. Then I can return get component. So I'll return a reference to the, to the component that I just created. One other thing here is that when I add a component, I may want to pass some arguments in here, right? So some components, um, for example, our, uh, our transform component, you want to have arguments that get passed into the component. So let's say we have like a vec2 um, or uh, an int or a double or a string or whatever. And so there's a, a neat trick in C++ and I'm just going to, from this point forward, I'm going to go over to this, which has already been done for you. So we can do what's called argument forwarding. And so instead of having to worry about what the arguments are and write different functions, if I go over now to the entity class that stores this, that, that the actual entity class that we're going to be using, I can do the following. If I want to take arguments to this function, no matter how many of those arguments there are, there could be one, there could be two, 50, zero, doesn't matter. I can forward those arguments into the components constructor. So what I do here in this function is I'm going to get a reference to where the component should be stored. Then I'm going to set that component equal to a new component of that type with the forwarded arguments. I'm going to set the has Boolean to true, and then I'm going to return the component. So that's how we add a component. Down here, um, this is the get component, which we just looked at. This is the remove component. And in order to remove component, all I have to do is overwrite the component with the default constructor of, of the component, right? Because it'll be resetting it back to, the, to the, de the default value where the has is equal to false. And so for assignment three, um, this is going to be what our component looks, or our entity looks like. So we're going to have a bunch of different component types. This is actually assignment four. And what I've done is I've used type def to type def this standard tuple of all these things, and I've called it a component tuple. So then the entity will store its standard things like it did before. So it will have its active Boolean, it will have its tag, it will have its ID, and then it will have its component tuple of components. And so in assignment three, that's how we, and I give this to you, you don't have to implement this, but now in assignment three, we're going to be doing things like this. Uh, if I go to like spawn player, right? So now we'll be doing things like this. So entity manager dot add entity player, and then 
player add component of this type. And then you forward in the arguments of this type of uh, components arguments. Okay? So this is how we're going to do this going forward. And this is a little bit of uh, solution code for assignment four. So screenshot that if you want. But it, it'll change before that. But now you can see how this is like just much nicer, right? So we're going to be add, adding components. We can remove components. And all this is really nicely done with these templated functions. And, and there you go. So that is the other big change. And now I don't have to explain this um, when I talk about assignment three. So this lecture, we went through and we talked about um, actions and replays. And we showed how that's going to be done. And we also went through and showed uh, how the entity class is going to store its components using tuples. So now we can use templated functions to get that. And so if I go back over here, so we've just completed this lecture. And in the next lecture on Tuesday, we will be giving out assignment three. And that'll be a really fun assignment to talk about. So that's it for the lecture. And I'm going to stop the recording there.